Um, this is the topic I'd like to talk to you about today, ICT and education transformation in the knowledge economy and knowledge society. Um, what uh, specifically what I'd like to talk about is what, uh, what does education transformation look like? Um, education reform, education transformation, these terms are, are used a lot and, and cover a lot of uh, different ideas about uh, what education should look like. And, and I'd like to give you uh, some concrete examples of, uh, of what, uh, how education can change in a way uh, that uh, addresses the needs of the knowledge economy and the knowledge society. Um, but I'd like to begin with that. Uh, if we're going to transform education um, to uh, meet the needs of the knowledge society and the knowledge economy, we need to have an understanding of what those terms mean. Uh, so what, uh, what is a knowledge society and what is a knowledge economy? So I'd like to talk to you uh, briefly about uh, those terms as well. Now, I understand that some, uh, although not all of you, um, have uh, had uh, access to a background paper uh, for today's sessions. And um, some of these uh, ideas are developed more completely in the background paper. So I I'm going to uh, just cover them rather lightly to make sure that the uh, people who didn't have access to the paper um, will understand the context for, uh, for the discussion today. Uh, but I'm going to focus and elaborate, uh, extend the paper, and really talk more about uh, education transformation and how ICT can be used to transform education. Um, and as Ferran mentioned, I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about the knowledge ladder. Um, which covers a range of, uh, of uh, kind of countries and developmental situations. But I'm going to focus and elaborate on, on two of the models that uh, Ferran mentioned, uh, the knowledge deepening and the knowledge creation models, because I think those are the ones that are most appropriate um, for uh, Catalonia and, and uh, Europe to be thinking about. Um, and, uh, and then I'd like to conclude with some ideas about how ICT and ICT policies uh, can transform education. Um, so that's the summary of today's uh, uh, discussion. Um, and I'd like to uh, begin uh, with uh, showing you a concrete example of what at least I think of as education that's totally transformed by, uh, by education. This is one particular instance that happens to be in uh, the state where I'm from, California in the US. Um, I, uh, it is by no means typical of education in the US. Um, in fact, I think we have very serious problems with uh, education in the US. Uh, and um, sometimes I feel we're actually going backwards. So uh, I don't want to use the US as a model, uh, but this particular school, I think, is certainly worth um, uh, uh, thinking about. And uh, we can then begin our, our discussions based on this example. In this converted Navy facility near the San Diego airport, thoughtfully applied technology is transforming public education. We're going to want to focus on the advertising throughout the school. Oh. They're doing things, they're producing things. So the purpose of tech in High Tech High is not for consumption, it's for production. A former high school carpentry teacher with a law degree, Larry Rosenstock, became founding principal and CEO of High Tech High in 1998. I tell our visitors who come here, Stop any child that you want, grades 6 through 12, at random, and ask them what they're working on yeah. and watch what happens. They'll look you in the eye and they'll talk to you about what they're working on. So what we're going to do in this class is we're going to make a, a movie or like a documentary on everything we learned. So we're learning 
about physiology, but we're also learning about like After Effects, which makes like videos and stuff. So bring them together. High Tech's 2,500 students gain entrance by lottery and represent a cross section of San Diego's public school population. Okay, trace it out. And whether they choose to focus on the arts or sciences, all of them are engaged in rigorous yeah, projects. Yeah. And one thing we want to be careful of is that we don't add your DNA to these samples and you come out in the end with your DNA barcode. In an 11th grade biology class, students are developing a DNA barcoding process that will help African law enforcement officials convict poachers. These are photos that I got last week from one of our collaborators in Nairobi. This is in Eland. I know everyone's really serious about it because it's a serious issue, but this is really a lot more fun than you'd be able to do in any other classroom. A lot of people donate stuff. Right, it just because looks like... Because we're our nonprofit. Right, right. Whenever possible, projects are designed to serve the local community. Whether it's creating a storage system for the YMCA, we have new storage facilities. Or right. We could actually take this out. Right. Or designing an assistive technology device. She used it for the first time and moved that bar up and down the paper for the first time herself. Her eyes just lit up. It was the first time she'd been able to do something on her own, and it was just the the students were tremendously touched. I was touched. It was just a really amazing experience. What's going on here? That's a fat that builds up. Instead of grades on high-stakes tests then, at the uh, end of the year, students are assessed on an ongoing basis. Well, assessment is not an end point. Or it's not an end activity. It's something that goes on moment to moment. So teachers are always checking for kids' understanding and so forth, and we're always asking kids to, in a lot of different contexts, to kind of describe what it is they're working on, what is they've discovered, what their plan is for the next day, and so on. So assessment is folded in. Good work, guys. All right, thank you. They are also judged on their individual digital portfolios and their stand and deliver presentations of learning. I'll start this presentation of learning today with math and physics, followed by Spanish 1 and finishing off with humanities. Instead of taking finals at our school, we do POLs, which is a presentation of learning, where we get up in front of the whole class and, and the teachers and a whole panel of people and tell them exactly like what we learned this year, how it can be applied to the real life, and how you've developed in critical thinking or developed in other things. Students are also assessed on their contributions to group projects, like books on the ecology of San Diego Bay. These are really high quality efforts by kids, as opposed to memorizing 3,000 biology words to prepare for the AP exam. We want kids behaving like scientists and behaving like photographers and behaving like graphic artists. The high-tech model is working. Point one, which is, is that line? The original high school has grown into a network of eight public charter schools. And maybe you could put that same kind of text here, here, and there. And 100 percent of high-tech high graduates are accepted to college. I really believe in this place. I, I, I've been here since the beginning, and I think it's, it, it is absolutely the true way to learn. And the brown is fine in the background? Yeah, the brown is fine, as long as you put those words in. OK. Thank you. OK. For more information on what works in public education, go to edutopia.org. Well, I, I don't know about uh, your school, but this looks very different from the school that uh, I went to when I was uh, a student. Um, and I think that uh, I think the differences are important, and it's it's not just the use of technology. Um, there was technology everywhere in in this school, but if that's all there was, it would look much like um, your school, uh, the school that I went to, except that it would have computers here and there in the classrooms. Um, but uh, here in this school, the curriculum was different. Um, students weren't just learning science. They weren't just learning art or math. Um, they were learning how to learn. Um, they had to report on what they learned, but they had to report on how they went about learning it. Um, Teachers asked them during the day what they were working on and what they were learning, and they had to describe that. Uh, but they also had to say what their plan was uh, for how they were learning and how they were going to go about doing it. This is all specifically part of the curriculum, in addition to math and science and, and art. Uh, it's assessed very differently. Um, 
as the emperor of rigor pointed out, um, the, um, it wasn't just the end of the term where they um, uh, took multiple choice exams. Uh, they were being assessed all the time. At any point, the teacher could come up and ask them what they were doing, what they were learning, how they understood it, what their plan was uh, for the next day. Um, so students were always being assessed. Uh, and the assessments were used as a way to help them learn better, not just to measure how much they had learned and whether or not they learned. Uh, teachers uh, were uh, doing things differently than the teachers that uh, in my school. Uh, in my school, the teachers were lecturing all the time. I don't think you uh, saw but a very little lecturing going on here. Uh, most of what was going on uh, was that the teacher was helping the students doing their work, providing some advice and some counsel. Um, what students was do were doing were very different. They weren't sitting in their seats uh, listening to the teacher, although some of that was happening. Um, they were uh, working on projects, uh, and these projects were connected to r the real world, uh, projects in collaboration with uh, uh, game wardens in Africa or uh, community organizers. So there was a connection between what students were learning uh, in school and how it could be applied to make life better for other people. Uh, the school was organized differently. Uh, it didn't seem to have uh, bells and uh, um, organized structure around uh, this is math class and this is a math teacher, although I'm sure that there was math going on and science going on, but it seemed that uh, there was more an integration of these, uh, of these subjects, much like there is in the real world. Um, also, the role of ICT was quite different here. Notice at the very beginning um, that the principal or the CEO of High Tech High um, said that the purpose of, of ICT, the purpose of technology, was not for consumption. It was for production. That students weren't just sitting in front of the computer uh, reading and, and um, uh, doing exams, but they were actually using it, much like you and I do uh, in our everyday work, uh, use it to find information, to create new products. So this is a kind of transformation that I think we need to look at. There are many other examples as well, but I thought it would be useful to start with a concrete uh, example here as we begin to think about, more generally, about larger trends and uh, the implications they have uh, for, um, for transformation in education. Well, why, why do we need to change education, uh, let alone transform education? And I don't use that term lightly, as, as you'll see as we progress here. Um, well, the fact is that everything else is changing but education. Uh, that if you look around in society, our society is changing in really profound ways uh, that are sometimes termed a knowledge society or the information society. Uh, what are the characteristics of a knowledge society? Well, uh, there's a lot more knowledge uh, that uh, people are, uh, have higher levels of education in a knowledge society. They go to school longer, but more than that, they're learning all the time. Um, you and I probably have been out of school, at least I've been out of school for a long time, but I'm still learning. Um, uh, I was learning a half an hour ago as I was sitting reading an article, um, um, that the, uh, a study that the OECD published. Um, so we, we don't need schools, uh, we don't need classes, uh, although they can be helpful even for adults. Um, but uh, Education is something that uh, is very important in a knowledge society. There's also a very high penetration of ICT, not just in businesses, but in the homes. Um, so um, 
in much of the U.S. Uh, or much of North America and Europe, uh, we have very high penetrations. Seventy percent or eighty percent of homes have ICT and access to the internet, um, and people are using ICT all of the time, uh, not just at work, uh, but they're using it at home. Uh, majorities of people are using it. Uh, for email, for uh, internet commerce, they're ordering things online. This is all part of a knowledge uh, society. A large majority of people use it as their primary source of information. Uh, when they have a question about their health or about uh, taxes or uh, social services or uh, who won the ball game, um, they look on the internet. Uh, uh, circulation of newspapers has gone way down over the last few years. Um, uh, people look on the internet first and then they'll talk to the doctor. Uh, and they ask much more informed questions when they talk to the doctor because they've done some preliminary research about uh, their medical condition. Um, an important uh, finding in the research on the use of ICT is young people are not using it just to consume information, not just looking up things on the internet, but particularly young people are using it in a more productive way, uh, that they're creating content and posting it on the internet. Large majorities of young people have, have internet accounts and profiles on the internet where they post photographs or uh, uh, post poems or videos that they've produced. Uh, and they share these in uh, networks with uh, their friends. So this is all part of uh, a knowledge society. And this is what students are engaged in all of the time. And then they come to school, and uh, the uh, internet and computers are used in a very marginal way that I'll talk more about in a moment. So what's a knowledge economy? Uh, our economy is profoundly changing, and I don't need to remind anybody here in Catalonia or Spain of that, um, something that, uh, that our colleagues in Brussels are talking about yet today. Um, the economy has uh, changed in ways that are profound, sometimes negatively, but also in, in very positive ways, uh, ways that uh, we need to be more sensitive to in education. Um, one of the ways that the economy is restructured is away from manufacturing as the primary source of economic growth towards what's called information products and services. That this has become the largest, uh, accounted for the largest amount of growth in the world's top economies growth in this area that matches or exceeds the decline in manufacturing as the percentage of, of uh, production in these countries. Um, also extremely important to a knowledge economy, what actually defines a knowledge economy, is the role of innovation in new knowledge, that these are really the drivers of, uh, of growth within these information products and services, that new knowledge, innovation, creativity are at the source of the development of new products and new services and whole new industries and new jobs, companies, industries uh, that we didn't have 10 years ago are, uh, are now an important part of our economy and an important part of our everyday life. Um, What's also happened is, is uh, not just this restructuring of the, of the macro economy, the economy at large, but um, when you look at, at businesses, the way businesses are organized and what uh, businesses do, there are fundamental changes that have occurred at that level. There are transformed practices where uh, in many businesses, the highest performing uh, businesses, according to research studies, um, are characterized by self-managed teams. Uh, it's much less a top-down kind of organizational structure and much more uh, collaborative effort where 
uh, people are working together and making decisions in teams or regular employee meetings and flexible work arrangements. So people are working at home or in different countries and in different time zones. Um, this is all part of the fundamental change in business practice. And of course, more and more people uh, in particularly uh, people on the front lines that are dealing with customers are using ICT as a way of, of being more responsive to customer needs and able to address problems that come up. Uh, as I mentioned, the organization uh, structure is transformed too so that businesses are are more flattened in terms of the organizational structure. There's less management uh, on top and more uh, participation at the, uh, at the kind of lower levels of the organization. Um, decentralized decision making. Uh, organizations are becoming disaggregated so that different pieces of the organization are spinning off as separate companies. Uh, there's outsourcing and offshoring uh, and cross-organizational collaboration uh, where groups of people are coming together around a specific project, uh, groups that may be within an organization or outside an organization. And for this project, they may be collaborators. For another project, they may be competitors. So that organizations are much more organic and dynamic. Um, in this new knowledge economy. Many of these transformations are enabled by ICT um, because ICT is, is being used to connect distributed teams of employees within organizations and across organizations, between organizations, um, to coordinate partners and suppliers uh, so that different companies who are working on different pieces of the project can have all of those come together and fit together seamlessly at the appropriate time uh, to uh, using ICT to collect and share information and provide uh, products and services directly to the customer online and get information and feedback from the customers so that the company can be uh, uh, responsive to the market as it changes. It's also important, and I think uh, particularly uh, for us, uh, for educators, to realize that these changes have profound implications for the kinds of skills that people need coming into the knowledge economy. Um, there have been many, many studies within uh, 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 within um, companies in, uh, in uh, both in North America and in Europe that have looked at the changes that are incurring uh, in the responsibilities that people have uh, and the kinds of jobs that are available. Um, one of the major changes, and this isn't uh, a surprise to anybody in this room, that there's a less, less of a demand for manual skills uh, that uh, uh, these skill, these uh, um, jobs are being taken over by robots and uh, automated assembly lines. Um, uh, products that used to require many, many people in order to put them to uh, uh, put products together are now being assembled by uh, by robots. But it's just it's not just the physical tasks uh, that are being replaced, but also routine cognitive tasks. So you see far fewer bank tellers. Uh, you see more and more self-checkouts at uh, grocery stores and department stores, reducing the number of people who have to, um, who have to, uh, who are clerks that fill out forms or, uh, or uh, respond to simple uh, uh, tasks. Um, there's more and more demand this is where the job growth is, more and more demand for advanced cognitive skills, uh, such as problem solving and communication and team skills. So that uh, jobs are changing in a fundamental way. 
uh, tasks within jobs are changing so that even people who have the same job are doing less of the simple tasks and more of the complex tasks. Uh, and where ICT is substituting uh, for simple tasks, it's augmenting complex tasks. So professionals like doctors and lawyers or professors or researchers uh, now uh, can only do their work because they have access to very powerful tools that help them find exactly the information they need or help them analyze data or visualize data in ways that would have been very difficult if not impossible for them to do uh, previously. So now people who are engaged in very complex uh, skills are, are having those skills augmented and facilitated by the use of ICT. Uh, these trans, oops, I've already done this one. Um, how is I? Uh, um, it's important, though, to realize that uh, ICT in studies that look at the impact of ICT, uh, they found that uh, the mere introduction of ICT into uh, business did not have an impact. That is, for many, many years, there was zero relationship between the introduction of ICT and increases in productivity, either at a macro level or at a firm level. Uh, it really took a considerable amount of time, five to seven years after the introduction of ICT, uh, before there were realizations of increases in productivity. And the reason for that is that it took a while for all of these other changes to happen uh, that were facilitated, enabled by ICT. So it wasn't just the introduction of ICT, it was the use of ICT to make all of these other changes that I mentioned. And it was only when all of these other changes occurred that you then found the increases in productivity that you were hoping for when the initial investment was made in ICT. Now, is ICT transforming schools? Well, I think the answer to that is really pretty straightforward, that the way schools, the way teaching, the way education is conducted now looks much like it did at the beginning of the century. And I'm not talking about the beginning of the 21st century. I'm talking about the beginning of the 20th century. So whereas there have been profound changes in the last 10 years, 20 years, in business and in society generally, our schools look much like they did 120 years ago. Now, there's a huge gap and a growing one now between the way we educate our students and the way our schools are structured and everything else in the world. And this is really alarming, and, uh, and really why we need to be thinking about change in, in, um, in education, really transformation of education. Not just the introduction of ICT, but how ICT can be used to make all of the other changes in education. So there's a more of a connection between how our schools are operated, how our schools are run, how our teachers teach, how our students learn, and what's happening in the rest of the world. But currently, if you look at studies that uh, examine how school is done, they're structured much like they were, as I say, 100 years ago, with classes meeting at a particular time, in a particular day, uh, in a particular place, with a particular group of students and a particular teacher. And uh, curriculum is broken up into silos, so you have a math class, and you have uh, uh, a science class, and you have an art class, and those things aren't connected. The curriculum is uh, in silos, and uh, teachers lecture, students are at their desk studying independently, um, Students are assessed with standardized exams that uh, test rote uh, recall of, uh, of uh, facts or simple principles. Um, technology, if it's used at all, 
is really a supplement. So if you look at studies of classroom use, you rarely find technology. It'll be there, but you rarely find it being used as an integral part of what students do every day. So when we think about education transformation, is one-to-one -one computing the answer? Will the introduction of computers giving each student a computer, will that transform education? Well, I, I don't think so. Is, is the introduction of computers enough? Well, I don't think so. I, the, the introduction of ICT alone is not going to transform education. We need to be thinking much more broadly about uh, the use of ICT in, uh, in education in this broader context of systemic change in education. Now, at a, at a policy level, uh, countries understand this. So if you look at policies in key countries around the world, they're talking about using technology to f facilitate uh, uh, student learning and moving towards uh, um, the knowledge economy and uh, uh, the knowledge society. So, uh, for example, in Singapore, where I've worked for the last 10 years, um, the uh, third master plan, they're on their uh, third ICT master plan, um, has as its uh, vision uh, to enrich and transform the learning environments of our students and equip them with the critical competencies and dispositions to succeed in a knowledge economy. Uh, we have a national plan um, in the U.S. Uh, and in the uh, preamble for that plan, we acknowledge the role of education as a key uh, to America's economic growth and prosperity and the ability to comp compete in the knowledge economy. Uh, Finland's plan uh, would develop an information society in which knowledge and expertise form part of the culture and also the key production factor in the economy. In Portugal, the prime minister launched, uh, as you may be aware, uh, a project called the Magellan Initiative uh, to uh, give laptop computers to every student as part of a larger vision to develop uh, high-tech industry in uh, Portugal. Uh, and if you look around the world, uh, many countries, uh, in fact, almost all countries, have an ICT plan of some sort or, or a policy. Um, and this, this goes from all of the uh, countries in, uh, in Europe and uh, in North America to even countries in, uh, in Africa. They all have a plan, all have a policy, um, but uh, either as a separate policy or part of a larger uh, education or even a, a national policy, digital policy. Uh, yet most ICT's uh, plans and policies have not been transformational. Um, so that if you look at schools, and I cite an OECD uh, study here, if you look at schools, uh, ICT is really rarely used. Um, that you ask uh, students, you ask teachers, 25% um, uh, uh, of the teachers or students use ICT on a regular basis. So in the majority of schools around the world, including here in Europe, ICT is in the classroom, but it's still not a major part of educational practice. So why hasn't ICT and ICT policies been transformational? Well, there are a number of reasons. Uh, one is that they're not really policies, but more projects or initiatives. It's kind of policies in bits and pieces. So it's not coherent, it's not coordinated, um, it's a, it's a one laptop project or it's a, a, a pilot project uh, in uh, certain schools in different regions of the country rather than an integrated coherent policy or vision for how it is ICT is going to change education. 
another reason why it doesn't work is that, well, every four years the government changes, and of course the new government wants a different policy. So teachers are confronted with, well, should I bother spending the time making changes in my classroom when this government is just going to be replaced by another government and there's going to be a whole nother policy. So um, why should I invest my time in making changes when it's all going to change again in the future? Um, uh, often uh, the reason why it isn't transformational is because I, uh, the ICT policy focuses just on technology. It doesn't really address uh, teacher skills, it doesn't really address the curriculum or assessment, and, and when teachers are confronted by uh, a uh, conflict between the use of technology and the fact that on the assessment students are going to have to uh, use paper and pencil assessments, well why should I bother having them use technology because after all they aren't going to use technology in the assessment. So, uh, so uh, there's a disconnection between the ICT policy and other kinds of policies that diminish the motivation teachers have for using technology in their classroom. Um, often ICT is a, a short-term strategy that doesn't have a long-term vision. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, in Singapore, they're on their third ICT plan. And uh, the third one built on the second one, and the second one built on the first one. So there was a long-term vision for where it is that, uh, that uh, uh, education was going in uh, technology, uh, excuse me, in Singapore. Um, uh, often the ICT policy is organizationally isolated that uh, the ICT department develops the ICT plan, uh, but they don't talk to the assessment department, they don't talk to the curriculum department, they don't talk to the teacher education institutions. And finally, policy is not, uh, doesn't specify measurable goals. Uh, and if something isn't measured, people are going to ignore it. They're not really going to take it seriously. So there are a number of reasons why technology policy hasn't been transformational, but uh, there are examples of good, uh, good education policy. And I want to point out uh, how, what the characteristics are of good education policy. This is based on uh, studies done by OECD and McKenzie that looked at high-performing school systems around the world school systems like Singapore and Finland, Germany and, uh, and England, and some states in the US. And they looked at the policies of these education systems, and one of the things they found is that each is different. Each is a unique response to the local context. Uh, but there were also some important commonalities, important things that were the same across. One was that there was a commitment to success for all students, that that was an important theme that cut across all of these policies, uh, that it's just not the elite students, it's all students that need to be performing at a high level. Because with a knowledge economy, what is important productivity factor is human capital. It's not just the material capital. It's that your people are performing at a very high level. And, and particularly if you're a small country like Singapore, which is more like the size of Catalonia as a country, um, much smaller, of course, as a, as a, a geographical space, uh, but uh, it, it's important that all of the students uh, be perform, all of their citizens be performing at a very high level if, if they're going to be competitive globally. Um, another is high quality of teachers. In Singapore, for example, in Finland, this is a, an important commitment is made to, uh, to the quality of teachers. In Singapore, you have to be in the top 10% of your secondary class to qualify to go into teaching. 
Now, uh, it's one thing to, to say that, but then you have to say, well, how is it that they get the top 10% to apply for teaching, uh, to apply to go into teaching school? Well, not only do they cover the tuition for uh, people who go into education, uh, but those who are accepted into teaching, teacher education are on the payroll of the Ministry of Education. They become employees of the Ministry of Education their first day as students uh, for education. So when you have that kind of motivation, uh, you have a different set of students who are interested in going into teaching. And of course, teaching has a very high level of cultural value uh, in Singapore, and that's an important component as well. Uh, another important uh, aspect of these uh, uh, high-performing uh, policies in these high-performing countries is that there's an alignment of, of uh, policies over a sustained period of time and that there are strategic investments made. Now, it's not the case that it's the countries that spend the most on education, but rather how it is they spend money on education so that they focus it on, say, teacher quality, or they focus it on uh, improving assessment. So it's the way that the money is spent, not just how much is spent, and that these changes are systemic. Now, how do you design transformative ICT policy? Learning from this study, we need to, first of all, acknowledge that there's no one size fits all. You have to be thinking about the context, uh, the unique local context. Each system is different. You have to be thinking about strategic investments. How is it that you spend your money on ICT? Uh, where is it, how is it that you use ICT? Not just the amount of technology that you purchase, but what are the strategic decisions made in, in how it's going to be used? Teacher is the key. Even in ICT policy, we have to be thinking about teacher rather than technology. We have to be thinking about the teacher first and then how the technology supports teaching. Coordinate ICT with other components and to think systemically how all of these components fit together. Now that's where the knowledge ladder comes in um, that I want to uh, uh, elaborate on. It's a conceptual framework for policy and planning. It's holistic, that is, it looks at all of the components, and not just ICT, but all of the components of the education system, and how it is that they can all be aligned and brought together. Um, it's developmental in the sense that it's progressive, uh, so you can look at um, countries or education systems or even uh, school districts or, or, or individual schools and think about where it is that school is and how it gets from where it is now to where it is that you want it to be in 5, 10, 15 years. Because we're talking about long-term change here. We're not talking about change that happens overnight. We're talking about change that happens in five, 10 years, 15 years. And we need to have a long-term vision. Um, how uh, you build on current resources to develop additional resources um, and connect these changes to economic and social development. So that's what we try and do with the knowledge ladder. It's a conceptual framework, um, as Fran mentioned, that has four models to it, uh, basic education, uh, knowledge acquisition, knowledge deepening, and knowledge creation. Um, each model has different implications for policy goals, for teaching and learning, for curriculum and assessment, uh, for social organization structure of schools, and specifically for ICT use. So you would use ICT differently in these different models. So it's a way of helping people think about, well, there's not one size fits all. Not everyone is going to use ICT in the same way. But how do we use ICT in different situations 
yet move towards the same goal of preparing our students for a knowledge economy and a knowledge society. I, I'm going to talk about the difference in the policy goals uh, of these four models, but then I'm going to focus on the two models, as I mentioned, uh, that are specific, I think, to the Catalonian context, which are knowledge deepening and knowledge creation, more like that example that we looked at at the beginning. Now, basic education, uh, the goal here is to increase workforce participation, improve basic health and welfare. This is really the model that you would be thinking of for Sub-Saharan Africa. It's really the millennium development model, if you will. Getting more young kids, more primary school kids into classrooms, increasing the participation at the youngest level of, uh, uh, in education. So the focus is really more on participation, particularly at the youngest grades. The knowledge acquisition is really more moving a country towards a, a, a developing uh, economy. Uh, particularly a manufacturing-based economy, um, and increasing secondary school participation, uh, and also improving test scores. Um, this is really where most of the world is focused. Uh, unfortunately, I have to say, this is really where the U.S. policy is focused, on, on uh, keeping kids in, in uh, high school, uh, increasing the secondary school participation, increasing test scores. But this, I must say, is really a mismatch between our policy thinking and, our, and the needs in, in the US, which our knowledge economy needs. We're still thinking in this old model of, of a manufacturing economy, where you want standardization, which is, of course, the keystone uh, of, a, of a manufacturing economy is it is mass production um, and having everything be the same. That's not the way society is anymore. Uh, you don't go out and buy the same thing that everybody else has. You want to personalize uh, your life. You want to be distinctive. Uh, you want products, even if, it's, if it is an iPad, that everybody else is buying. <laughs> you want it to look differently, and you're going to use it in a different way that everybody else has. So the way that it's used needs to be customized to your needs and your interests and your desires, rather than standardize things. So what happens with a manufacturing model uh, for the education system, students go into classrooms and they have to learn the way everybody else does to learn the same thing that everybody else is learning and they go out in the real world and everything is different. Everyone wants a different thing. Everyone wants their own thing. So the world to them is customized. School is standardized. And, and so no wonder the students perceive a mismatch between schools and the real world. And more and more employees see a mismatch between what it is that we're producing at the end of education and what it is they need. They need creativity. They need knowledge production. They need uh, critical thinking. They need problem solving. They don't need standardization. That they can get with a computer. They can have the computer handle the standardized tasks. They're looking for innovation. They're looking for creativity, and we're not giving them that. So this is really the purpose of the other two models, the knowledge deepening model and the knowledge creation model. With knowledge deepening, it's still focused on classroom learning, on subject matter learning, but it's approaching it in a different way. It's thinking about subject matter much more deeply. So rather than coverage of a large number of things, it's focusing on the key underlying ideas that really define a discipline. What are the key ideas in chemistry? What are the key ideas in mathematics that explain all of the other things? And what they focus is, is on the understanding these key ideas in a deep way that allows you to apply them 
in novel situations that allows you to use them to solve real world problems. So there's this connection between school subjects and real world situations that you saw in the example that we, uh, the example video a moment ago. Uh, graduates apply these, school, uh, apply these school learning to solve real world problems and that's the assessment. Uh, and I'll come back to that in more detail. Uh, the knowledge creation model from a policy perspective is that you're producing students that can compete in the knowledge economy. So this is kind of the end state, if you will. This is really what we're trying to move towards, is creating students who can compete in the knowledge-driven economy and society, and graduates who are creative, innovative, lifelong learners that continue to learn long beyond uh, school and are learning constantly throughout their career and lifetime. Now let me focus a bit more on each of the, on these two um, models from the perspective of each of the components. So for example, in curriculum and assessment, if you look at knowledge deepening, as I mentioned, uh, you're looking at the subject matter, but you're looking at it from the perspective of the key concepts and how it is they're applied in the real world. And it's also important to assess them as they are applied in the real world. So that students don't answer just multiple choice questions. Uh, they don't uh, apply a simple uh, uh, rules or procedures to uh, problems that are already given to them. But they have to analyze complex situations to even figure out what the problem is. And then they have to come up with the approach um, and this may, there may be more than one approach. Uh, there may be, quite likely is, more than one approach to uh, answering this problem. And they may think about what are the uh, differences between this approach and that approach and which is the better of the two approaches. And this becomes part of the assessment. Not just getting the right answer, but how it is they went about solving the answer. And that's the important part of the assessment what it is that students learn. In knowledge creation, the focus is not just on school subject matter, but on these transversal processes that cut across subject areas, like creativity and problem solving and uh, creating new product, knowledge products. Um, and notice here the, the changes in assessment is that the, uh, students are assessed by a community of users. Um, much like you and I are, or our businesses. Um, they're assessed by going out and trying to sell their product to uh, satisfied customers, creating a market base of satisfied customers who then go out and sell the product for them. So there's uh, multiple ways of assessing student learning, not just the teacher uh, who says that the student has something right or wrong. If you look at teaching and learning and how it is that we need to uh, change in order to uh, address these new skills and new content, um, teachers need to know the subject matter deeply uh, because they need to help students understand it deeply. But they also need to have deep pedagogical expertise. They need to know how how students are misunderstanding the concept and what the typical kinds of errors in thinking are. So they need to have pedagogical expertise that would allow them to understand where students are going wrong and how it is that they can improve, edu uh, improve the instruction so that students can learn better. Um, also, students in their learning work in collaborative teams, much like we saw in the video, working on complex real-world problems. In the knowledge creation model, teachers are collaborators and model learners. They're really innovators. So part of what's happening in a knowledge creation school is that teachers are engaged in creating knowledge, uh, that they're collaborating uh, with each other, uh, with uh, professors at research institutions, thinking about new ways of teaching and constantly improving their teaching 
trying new ideas out, coming up with new ideas, trying them out, seeing them if they collecting data to see if they if they're improvements or um, or not. Uh, and students are working in com communities of learners, not just with others in their class, but with uh, older siblings or students in other schools or experts out in the real world. Uh, so the social structure is changing in these models uh, so that uh, st uh, teachers are collaborating with each other in the knowledge deepening model, breaking disciplinary boundaries so that math and science are taught together, or science and literature, or science and history, uh, or art and literature. So these things are brought together that allow students to think more deeply about problems and situations they encounter and think, at them, think about them from multiple perspectives. Uh, in, in the knowledge creation model, you're getting to the point of any time, anywhere learning uh, that happens throughout your lifetime in sustained cross-age, cross-sector knowledge communities. So how is it that ICT is used in these, uh, in these models? And the deepening model, again, you're focusing on deep understanding. Here, it's appropriate to use simulations, to, uh, multimedia to help students deeply understand very difficult to understand uh, uh, concepts that are at the core of the subject matter in chemistry or math or history um, so that students are engaged say in history in simulations of what would happen if you uh, change things in a, in a simulated world to understand key concepts around group organization, uh, around group dynamics, uh, around political parties and how they interact with each other. Uh, computers are used not just in laboratories, but they're used in the classroom, so you bring them into the classroom uh, so that students are using them all the time as part of their, uh, part of their learning every day. Uh, in knowledge creation, uh, you go beyond the learning of school subjects and you create social environments. You, what you're doing here is creating innovative uh, innovation hotbeds where teachers and students are interacting all of the time with each other, innovating coming up with new ideas, that that is really part of the practice. That's really part of what it is that students are learning. How to innovate, how to think creatively. And they, the ICT is giving them the tools to connect with other students uh, within uh, the school, outside the school, to connect with experts, to connect with uh, people in other countries, uh, to help them understand and build knowledge. Uh, and computers and other kinds of digital devices are really used everywhere all of the time. So how is it, if you're a teacher, can you transform your schools with ICT, um, create these knowledge deepening and knowledge creation schools? Well, again, start with the teachers, building their content knowledge, deepening their understanding of the, of the school, of the uh, subject matter, uh, improving their pedagogical skill and their technological expertise. Um, supporting cross-subject collaboration and knowledge building communities among teachers and students. Um, I, I think of the example in, uh, in Singapore where I've worked for 10 years and looked at uh, schools uh, many, many times across those 10 years. It's just now that I'm seeing uh, profound change, systemic change in schools, in part because teachers are now forming innovative committees uh, and teachers are submitting innovations uh, to these committees of other teachers. Uh, there are ideas about changes often involve ICT and they submit these proposals with a request for resources uh, and teachers review these ideas and comment on them and s make suggestions for improvements. Uh, and they learn from each other about uh, innovations that they come up with. 
And it's really when you have this innovation going on, often facilitated by ICT, uh, that you really see sub substantial changes in schools supported by ICT and uh, uh, rich content, uh, real world projects, and encouraging teachers to embed ICT throughout the curriculum. If you're a policymaker, how do you think about ICT uh, in, as a lever for change? Well, you begin with a vision, what it is that you want education to look like five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, enriched by technology that enables schools to change. Uh, creating a long-term trajectory, five years at a time, how, how schools are going to look five years from now and subsequently moving towards this long-term vision. Building alignment between policies so that you have policies and programs that are tightly aligned, um, aligned within agencies, across agencies, so that curriculum uh, and assessment, teacher professional development, and ICT are all working together towards this vision. Implementing the vision, evaluating it, revising it, uh, that's all an important part of this, having measurable goals and looking at progress towards those goals. Because ICT alone will not transform education. You need to be thinking about it systemically. I think that, um, as I pointed out earlier, uh, if you don't have indicators, if you don't have measures, uh, then people aren't going to take it seriously. So uh, perhaps you're... Um, foisting me on my own uh, petard, so to speak, uh, hanging me on my own words. Um, but I think, that, uh, uh, I think that that is an important uh, element of this, is to uh, think systemically about, okay, if we're going in this direction, what, what would that look like? And, and I think that um, uh, a part of what that does is, is take this conceptual framework and then begin to uh, overlay it on, uh, on um, real world practice, um, much as we saw uh, here in this video. Um, uh, because, uh, you know, I think we can kind of come up perhaps with some indicators from uh, our own thinking, um, but it would be useful to try and identify schools that are, you know, you could classify as knowledge deepening or knowledge creation. Um, and, and that's not to say that these are two separate categories of, uh, of schools, that, this is, uh, that these are mutually exclusive. But, but rather, this is a, a kind of, uh, the way that I see the knowledge ladder is, is a kind of gradation. Um, so that, the, that you're moving towards this, and you'll see some, in some schools, you'll see some knowledge deepening practices and some knowledge creation practices. Um, so it's, it's not that they're mutually exclusive, but I think what would be an interesting challenge in answering your question would be to identify some innovative schools like this and actually do observational studies um, that uh, specify what uh, what teachers are doing, what students are doing, uh, what um, um, what uh, classes look like. It kind of uh, goes back to our sites uh, module two study, uh, where we went to innovative classroom. This was ten years ago, so we didn't have a scheme like this to use. Uh, but it would be, I think. Uh, enlightening to take a scheme like this and go out and 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 it would also inform the the conceptual framework that maybe all of these things don't really make sense that you'll find some things are actually make more sense than other things um, so I think it would be both a, a kind of validation uh, exercise to the for the model as well as uh, empirically deriving uh, some of these indicators. Uh, and then you could uh, associate the indicators with specific performances or uh, uh, measures uh, 
uh, that could then be implemented in, in uh, subsequent, um, subsequent evaluation studies as you move towards, uh, towards implementation of the, of the plan. I think that uh, you know, if we're talking about transforming the education system, um, the role of parents is very, very important. Um, because uh, education can't be transformed without the participation of, uh, of parents. Um, I, I think one of the most compelling examples of uh, uh, using ICT and connecting it to parents is actually one of the cases that we came up with. This is now 10 years ago or more um, here in Catalonia. Uh, with the study that we did, uh, the IEA Sites uh, Module 2 study, which actually looked at the use of ICT um, in uh, uh, five rural uh, schools in Catalonia. Um, and um, uh, it's always been one of my favorite cases um, because uh, usually we think of of ICT in this very kind of sophisticated way that uh, is appropriate for secondary school students. But here they were very young students who were going out into the community um, uh, with digital cameras and digital uh, recorders and uh, taking photographs of the town square, interviewing their grandparents, uh, uh, and uh, collecting all kinds of digital multimedia uh, information about their community. Uh, and then they put together uh, a website, uh, each of these five schools that were all participating in the project. Uh, each school had a website that uh, presented the students' work uh, that represented uh, the community. Um, uh, that the students had produced, and then they had a, a fair where all of the teach, uh, all of the parents came in, and the students presented their work, and the teachers discussed the project. Um, and I think that that kind of collaboration, uh, where uh, parents are involved in the project, where students are going out into the real world. Uh, and using technology to produce things that are of value to parents and of value to the community, and then having the parents come in and uh, evaluate the quality of the students' work and see how students are learning, that that's the kind of relationship that I think really is, is transformative. It's we very rarely see, and yet it's... Uh, uh, it's a kind of thing that could happen more and more. Ten years ago, of course, there weren't all of these, all of the social networking, uh, which you could, you could then see not just the web, but you could see, well, with all of the social networking, you could involve the teachers in, a, in an ongoing way in, as participants in the schools. And I think this would be reassuring to the parents because uh, it's not just something going on in the school that they are not familiar with and they're worried about, um, but they're participating in and can be reassured by it and see what it is that students are doing and contribute to it. Um, so I, that, I think, is a kind of model that we would should have in mind in terms of uh, parent uh, cooperation and collaboration. Well, there, there are a lot of uh, problems and um, uh, questions uh, uh, combined in that, uh, uh, in that uh, topic. Um, let me try and, and uh, break some of that apart. Um, the problem that you identify reminds me of a, of a situation where um, this was in Uganda. Uh, I was uh, visiting a rural high school and um, uh, they had a very uh, interesting project in that school. And I was talking to uh, the teacher, um, and uh, he was very animated, very excited uh, about this project. He was telling me about his students were collaborating with students 
uh, in South Africa and students in Canada on projects and that the um, the students got very excited about these projects, spent a lot of time on them and uh, and were doing some very interesting work. And we were standing in the middle of the computer lab surrounded by 16, 18 brand new computers. Um, uh, but this was the middle of the school day and there were no students in this classroom. And so I had to ask him about why are there no students in this classroom? And he said, well, there's a problem here. Um, uh, we don't uh, um, have ICT as part of the curriculum. So I can't really do this project during the school day. Uh, I have to do it uh, in the evenings and on the weekends. Uh, but you should come back on Saturday because there are parents here, there are students here, they're all very excited. Uh, and and I, you know, I thought to myself, well, this is such an obvious example of the point that you are making where if you don't change the curriculum, you know, you're, you're not going to get profound change. You have to think about how long is this teacher going to come back to school on the weekends and in the evenings uh, with these students um, out of his or her own time uh, to support this project. Uh, you really need to be thinking about changing the curriculum, changing the assessment, and that has to be done at a national level. It has to be done at a policy level. Um, one of the changes that I saw in uh, in Singapore, and I, I keep bringing up Singapore for a number of reasons. I'm very familiar with the situation there, having worked uh, with the Ministry of Education for all three of their master plans, and having gone there um, every other year for the last 10 years and visited many, many schools. So over the 10 years, I've seen a lot of progress, also because Singapore is one of the highest performing education systems in the world. So it's, it's a useful model. I'm not recommending that everybody should look like Singapore. That's not the case. But it's, it's a useful uh, case to look at. And one of the things that uh, I saw happen in Singapore over the 10 years is that more and more the schools made decisions and the teachers made decisions. Um, Singapore used to be a very highly centralized education system. All the decisions were made by the Ministry of Education, and the teachers and the school leaders merely implemented the decisions that were made by the ministry. But over that 10-year period, um, there was a, a plan to move more of the decision-making uh, to the schools. Now remember, though, uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, you have very highly trained teachers in Singapore. Um, so you, you can't do this overnight. You can't just say, okay, now the teachers are going to make more of the decisions or the school leaders are going to make more of the decisions. There has to be a plan that's a 5, 10, 15 year plan to improve the quality of teachers so they have the skills and they have the confidence of the parents. Um, and during that time, giving, stu giving the teachers more and more of the responsibility. Uh, so that in Singapore, it moved from um, the Ministry of Education having a master plan, which they still do, uh, to each of the schools has to develop their own ICT plan. Now, it has to reference the master plan. There has to be some connection between the school master plan and the ICT master plan of the, of the ministry. But the teachers have a lot of decisions about how the details of how they're going to implement their uh, technology in their school. And they also have the budget so that more and more the budget was shifted to the schools so that the teachers and the school leaders could make decisions about how to spend the technology money um, and how it, the, the decisions about how it was going to connect with, with their plans for innovation. Now again, remember I mentioned that part of that is that 
the teachers were coming up with innovations, that that was part of what, we, what I saw happening in the schools, that they were writing uh, proposals with, of, the, of their ideas for uh, uh, new ways of teaching and using technology. And that proposal would have a budget. And that would be reviewed by the school leader and by other teachers in this innovation committee. And they would comment on it and, and help the teacher improve it. And then the best ones would get funded. But even the ones that didn't get funded, the teachers were starting to think in ways that they didn't think before. They were starting to make decisions that they didn't make before because the ministry was making it. So this, I think, has to be part of the vision for uh, the future and plans put in place that would begin to move more of the decision making to the school leaders and to the teachers where innovation is happening at the school level and schools are becoming innovative organizations. Um, and, and in that situation that, that parents will have more confidence uh, that uh, the schools and the teachers have the capacity uh, and the vision uh, to educate their kids for the knowledge economy. Uh, well, again, I think there are um, many issues that, uh, that you've identified, and I can't uh, address all of them, but I, I'd, I would like to focus on one that I think is central to uh, the point that you were making, which is that um, uh, the, the contrast between uh, the uh, primary school students who seem to have the latitude to be more creative and secondary students who seem to narrow uh, their, um, their learning uh, to a very uh, narrow range of, uh, of school subjects. And, and I, I think that is a real problem because um, what we're trying to do with particularly with secondary students uh, is prepare them uh, for the real world. And, and yet uh, we do um, a terrible disservice uh, to secondary students by making school subjects uh, so narrow in, in focus and, and making uh, them um, uh, to the exclusion of, uh, of other aspects of knowledge, uh, which are more creative and more productive, um, more expressive, uh, such as art and music, that often those aspects of schooling, when there are budget cuts, are the ones that get uh, pushed aside. And uh, there's a focus on a narrow range of school subjects. But if you look at what's happening in the economy and what's happening in society, it's really the integration of science and technology with aesthetics, with design, with beauty, with, uh, um, uh, with uh, art and music and history. Uh, if you look at the technology, it's really the integration of technology and science with music, with visuals, with graphics, with art um, that makes them compelling. Uh, so if you look at the economy and you look at the new products in the economy, it's not just the technology, it's not just science. So I think we're doing a big disservice to our uh, secondary students by narrowing the curriculum and focusing only on, on uh, science and math. I mean, these are important, of course, but um, so are these other aspects of, uh, of learning. And, and it's when you make the connection between what's going on in school and what's going on in the real world that you realize that you have to make that. Um, you have to include those uh, aspects of learning, art and science, connecting art and science, connecting um, literature and music, um, that those are connections that go on in the real world and uh, students need to have those integrated in, um, in the, uh, secondary school. So I think your point is a very important one and part of the reason that we need to rethink the curriculum and rethink assessment so that we're not 
um, just measuring in a very standard way the learning of a small set of, of, uh, of knowledge, uh, but thinking broadly about what it is that education is and how it connects with the, with the real world. And technology is really an important bridge between uh, schools and the real world. And it, and it has the expressive capacity uh, that allows students to uh, be creative um, if that's the way it's used um, in, in schools.